Well, hello again. If you brought your Bibles, please get them out. Turn them on if they're electronic. If you don't have one, we have some on the table back there. And it will be on page 800 of the, the Bibles that the, the church provides. So we'll be in uh, Matthew 28. Matthew 28. So how many of you get really depressed when you read the newspaper or look at the news or scroll through your Facebook page about all the bad things that are going on in the world today? Yeah. I can't be the only one. I see some nods. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how did we get here? And, not, and I don't mean how did you get here to, to Freedom Church, but how did we get to where we're at? How did we get to the place where the majority of the news articles are negative? Um, people are dying. People are being abused. Bad things are happening. Kids are getting bullied. Schools are getting shot up. How did we get here? It just seems like over the last 10 or 15 years, things have gotten progressively worse, haven't they? And, and I, I think we know why. I think we know the solution to the problem. But I think either way you look at it, whether things are going wrong in our own lives or things are going wrong in the world, we all try to fix it ourselves, don't we? If something's wrong in our life, maybe we turn to alcohol, or we turn to drugs, or we turn to relationships to try to solve our own problems. And that just leads us right back into the broken world. We as a, as a society, maybe we enact laws to try to stop bad people from being bad. And what happens? Those laws get broken, don't they? And, and deep down inside of us, we know that all this brokenness that we're seeing is not the way God designed the world. We were designed to, to live in harmony with one another, to live in harmony with God, in harmony with nature and, and everything around us. So how did we get from, from God's design, from God's purpose, from God's perfect creation to the brokenness that we see today? And the answer is simply sin. We tried to go our own way. We tried to be our own God. We tried to do our own thing, and it didn't work. And that nothing that we do can try to fix it. Did God leave us there, though? Does God leave us in brokenness? He doesn't, does he? What did he do? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, right? What did he do? He sent his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All that's required for us to get out of brokenness and to get back to God's design is belief. Believe that we are sinners. Believe that Christ paid the price for that sin. Now that doesn't automatically fix our life. It doesn't fix every relationship, does it? But by working with Christ, by working with the Holy Spirit, we can experience newness of life, new relationships, different relationships, better relationships. When we follow God's design and God's purpose for life, for relationships, Things don't go entirely smoothly, but they go better. And we, we, we can know that in the future, when this world ends or when we pass on, that we will be in eternity. We'll be in heaven. We will inhabit a new heaven and a new earth with God. And it'll be perfect. And what we have at, at, at Easter is just a, a, a glimpse of that. And, and, and it's kind of the beginning of that that journey for all of us. So let's look at that. Let's look at that. Jesus was crucified and he was buried, but death could not hold the Son of God. And on the third day, God demonstrated Jesus' victory over sin and death by raising him from the dead. And we're going to see in the story that, that, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he had interactions with some people, and every time he was interacting with them, they, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. As the women went from the tomb to tell the disciples, Jesus appeared to them and they, they worshipped him. And But we are also going to see a picture of the religious leaders who continued to deny him. To deny him the worship that he deserves. They refused to worship him. And when Jesus met with his disciples, they also worshipped him. And, and then in that worship, Jesus gave them an assignment. He commanded them to make disciples of all nations, of all people groups, of all languages. Matthew wrote this gospel to show that Jesus Christ was Israel's long-awaited king and Messiah. He began this book 
by establishing that Jesus was the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, the birth of the Savior, the birth of the King, the birth of the Messiah. That's why I, I love Christmas. Easter's my favorite holiday, right? But, like, without Christmas, there's no Easter. Without Easter, there's, there's no need for Christmas, so they go hand in hand. But about slipped into my Christmas messages. All right. He began this book by establishing that Jesus was the fulfillment of those prophecies. And by the end of the book that we're going to see today, it's clear that Israel had rejected Jesus as their king and his disciples had abandoned him. We see in Matthew 27 that Jesus was crucified on a cross, a gruesome death. Like we wear crosses around our necks and, and, and we should, we should celebrate that and we should show that we are, are Christians. But you guys realize that that's an instrument of torture? It, it was not a, a clean thing? I was at a church once and they had this, this really nice looking cross and, and then after, after they preached, it was a Good Friday message, one of the, the guys who was attending the church looked at the cross and said, that's way too clean. That's way too nice. So he went home and he... he if you've never built a cross by yourself, it's a very humbling thing. You lay out next to a, a piece of wood and measure it and then cut it. And he, he made the cross and it still looked too pretty, so he, he burned it a little bit and then took some chains and whipped the, the cross and made it really ugly and charred because that's what the cross is. It's, a, it's a torturous. It's torturous. And he was crucified and then he was laid to rest in a tomb and and uh, the grave, though, could not hold him, because Jesus is king over life and death. See, he died, and three days later was raised from the dead. And that resurrection of Jesus, it's the single greatest event in the history of the world. The single greatest event. We, we mark our calendar by the birth of Christ, right? And it's his life, it's his death. Is just so amazing. It's why we, we gather together, not just on Christmas and Easter, but we gather every Sunday to, to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So let's look at Matthew 28, the first seven verses. In, in these verses, we see that an angel announced that the king was alive. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said he would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. Now go quickly, tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. Yes. See what just happened? Jesus, dead, laid in a tomb. Big stone rolled in front of him. Some people show up. And he's gone. He's not there. I should be getting goosebumps right now. That's awesome. That's the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He, he was, he was the, the king that defeated sin at the cross. We all know the Bible verses. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are, all make mistakes. Anybody in here perfect? No? Husbands, that would have been a good time to point at your wife, right? <laughs> But no, we're not perfect. We all make mistakes. We all sin. We all violate God's commands in one way or another. And if you think there are perfect people, wait until you have kids. Right? And what's the penalty for our sin? Romans also says, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. And there's a lot of churches that focus on this. You're a sinner. You deserve death and you deserve to die. You should feel guilty. You should feel bad. They ignore the second part of that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? So we've all sinned and we're all deserving of death. We're all deserving to die. We all deserve anything but mercy and grace. 
Hebrews talks about without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And when, when I first became a Christian, I'll be honest with you, uh, the blood songs that Christians sang, nothing but the blood, all that, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Why are you singing about blood? It's weird. That's cultish almost, right? But when we realize that God's demand for sin was, sacrifice, was sacrifices, bulls, pigeons, whatever it happened to be, had to be killed, their blood had to be shed in order to cover the sin, to cover them, to protect them from the wrath of God. And then we see the, the bloodiness of the cross of Christ and the, shed, the blood that He shed for you and for me. He is the covering for our sin. That's why we don't have an altar here and we don't have animal sacrifices. That and I wouldn't be a pastor because I can't stand the sight of blood. Right? Count me out of that. And Trent too, right? Jesus defeated sin at the cross. Christ's death on the cross satisfied God's justice. It purchased mercy for us. Justice demanded that sin be paid for. So when Jesus died on our behalf, he died the death we deserve so that we can have mercy that we don't deserve. He bore the brunt of God's fury towards sin. He faced abandonment. He faced isolation, separation from the Father while on the cross when he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had momentarily turned his back on the Son as, as the, the full weight of God's wrath was laid on him. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes here that I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. We all have important things in our life, don't we? But what's the number one most important thing for a follower of Christ? Jesus. So Paul, I passed on to you what was most important, what had been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as as the scripture said. So you have the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ being the most important thing to Paul. Is it the most important thing to us? You see, the central symbols of our faith are the empty cross and the empty tomb. They're a sign that we don't seek the living among the dead, that Christ is risen, he is alive. Let's practice this again. He is risen. He's risen indeed, that's right. So he defeated sin at the cross, and then he defeated death at the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 56 and 57. For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is scary, isn't it? One day we're all going to die. Cora has started to ask some questions about what happens when, when I die. It's, those are tough questions to answer, aren't they? But we all know there is going to be an end to our life someday. At least life on this earth. For those who believe in Christ, who believe that Jesus paid the price for our sins, our, the death of our physical body does not mean that we're done. We live on for all of eternity in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? My wife was a hospice social worker for a number of years, and she could always tell when she walked into a room of someone who was dying whether or not they were a believer, because there was hope in the air. And you probably know the same thing, being nurses and seeing this, that, that when people know what's on the other side, there's a peace about them, there's a calmness about them. Because they know that, that this is not their home. That they're just merely traveling through here. It's amazing. All right, so after the resurrection, King Jesus appeared to the women and he received their worship. Look at verse 8 in Matthew 28. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. They rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. They ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. They ran into the resurrected Lord, and their response was to fall at his feet in worship of him. Worship means to display one's love and commitment by, by actively giving praise and honor and adoration. 
In that moment, these women understood the reality of, of their Savior's resurrection, and they could do nothing other than worship Him. They knew with certainty that Jesus was the Messiah, the divine Son of God. And these women did what everyone will eventually do. You see, the Bible says that God has exalted Jesus through the resurrection, so at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. One day, every single person in this room, every single person that has ever lived, will confess that Jesus is Lord. Some of us will do it with smiles on our faces and hands raised in, in a joyful way, and some will do so through clenched teeth, refusing to recognize who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. So much better to acknowledge him with a smile and with joy and, and receive that grace and mercy and that love. Jesus again repeated that the angel's message that they were to give a message to the disciples to go to Galilee, that he would see them there. You see, what, what we have here is we have a picture of the resurrection, and it's not only amazing on a physical level, but it's evidence of, of some other important truths. And each one of these could be a 45 minute sermon on their own, but no? All right. <laughs> First of all, we see that it's evidence that God's word is true. Jesus made a bunch of claims, and everything that he said was accomplished. Everything that he predicted was accomplished. As, as Paul said, what I received unto you, that, that Christ died according to the scriptures, and he was buried and rose according to the scriptures, the word of God is true. This is one of the most attacked books there is. Everybody thinks that they can disprove the Bible. What's interesting is the majority of people who spend their life trying to disprove the Bible, you know what they end up doing at the end of their lives? Bowing their knees and worshiping God. The president of the Berean Fellowship, Scott Mathis, majored in history to disprove the Bible. Now he's led hundreds of people to the Lord because he couldn't do it. You can't disprove this. Everything in here can be explained. We, we may not understand all of it. We may not like some of it, right? But, but it's true. It's true. What's amazing is when you read this every day, when you try to live your life according to this, when you ask God to help you live according to God's word, life is awesome. It's amazing. So, so the resurrection is evidence that God's word is true. It also shows that Jesus is truly the Son of God and that Jesus controls both life and death. See, if Jesus had stayed dead, we wouldn't be here. We'd be worshiping some, something or somebody else. Right? Or we'd be worshiping ourselves. But, but we wouldn't be here. The resurrection is evidence that salvation has been accomplished. God having accepted Jesus' sacrifice as a sin bearer. Because Jesus did not stay dead, we can see that we have victory over sin, that we have victory over death, and that's the last one. That finally, it's evidence of the future resurrection for believers. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man. So when Adam sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, death came into the world. As death came into the world through one man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised at the first of the harvest, and all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. One day, we will be resurrected from the dead. It's awesome. And the only response that we should have to that is worship. Thank you, God, for the resurrection. Thank you that one day our bodies will be resurrected. I'm hoping for my 17-year-old body, right? <laughs> before before the Oreos, before the beer, before all that stuff, right? <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. We'll see. But our bodies, either way, now or 
my younger self, my body will work perfectly. I'll be able to run and jump. I won't be twisting my ankles or my knees won't be hurting. My back won't be hurting. All of the stuff that you're going through is, is can be taken care of. It's amazing. All right. So, he was raised from the dead. The women ran from the tomb and they, they met him and they worshipped him and they received his message. And then we have this short little report here of the guard where we see that the Jewish leaders denied the truth of the resurrection. Verse 11, as the women were on the way, some of the guards went into the city, told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called. They decided to give the soldiers a, a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it to this day. These soldiers were stationed at the tomb under Pilate's order. And the fact that Jesus' body was gone, they could have been killed for it. They should have been killed. So can you... What, what's your life worth, money-wise? Hey, I need, I, you, something happened, you're supposed to die for it. How much money can I give you to lie about it? That had to be a pretty large bribe, didn't it? For them to risk their life. And although the religious leaders, they knew that Christ said he would rise on the third day, that's why they asked for soldiers to be stationed there. They had heard the first-hand accounts of the unbiased soldiers who said, hey, uh, Jesus is gone. Uh, his disciples didn't come, but he's not there. He got up and walked out. Um, it's, yeah, I know it's hard to believe, but but that's what happened. right? They, they had heard that. They had seen him do miracles. They re still refused to accept the fact of Jesus' resurrection. No miracle, not even Jesus' resurrection, could bring these religious leaders to worship Jesus Christ. And today we don't have Christ walking around the earth performing miracles. We have his church. We have his believers, right? We still see miracles happen. We still see um, uh, cancers healed and all of that. But, but we don't have Jesus walking around doing that. He works through his people. But what we do have is the truth of God's word. We see the, this true story. We see the word. And we see the word asking us to submit to Christ and to worship him as our king. 1 Peter 1 says this, You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him, the reward for trusting Jesus, will be the salvation of your souls. Don't deny the resurrection of Jesus. Don't reject the, the, the resurrection of Christ. Don't rebel against the resurrection of Christ. Receive the grace and mercy that's offered because of the resurrection of Christ. So, oh man. I could talk every week, and I probably should talk every week about the resurrection of Christ, but it's just, it's amazing what, what it did. The joy that we should have in the salvation of our souls and what I love about Matthew's gospel is it doesn't end with just these women worshiping Jesus, with the religious leaders rejecting Jesus. It doesn't end there. We get to the passage known as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee. So Jesus told them before he died, after I died, go to Galilee. He had the women come tell him, go to Galilee. Wait for me there. So they finally listen. They finally obey. The eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, what did they do? They worshipped him. But some of them doubted. My goodness. How often is that us, right? Like, God does a miracle in our life. God works amazingly in our lives. Then we still doubt him. These people, and, and so I kind of use this as an excuse for my doubt sometimes. They saw the resurrected Christ, and they still doubted him. He had the, the, hand, the holes in his hands and feet. He had a big gash in his side, right? They still doubted him. 
Verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given them. Be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus' command, and at pretty much every time Jesus runs into him before he was, was taken up to heaven, he's telling them the exact same thing. Go make disciples. Make disciples. Make disciples. You will receive power when my spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses all over the world. Make disciples, make disciples. So his main command here was to make disciples. And a disciple is of Jesus is a loyal follower and he's a learner of Christ. And there's three kind of components to this making disciples. It's going, baptizing, and teaching. See, he had to tell his disciples to go to the ends of the earth. Don't wait for the world to come to you. Go. And it's the same thing for us. Don't wait for people who are far from God to come to us. We need to be going. God's placed you somewhere at work or some family situation, some neighborhood that you need to, to share the gospel with people. Go. Go. And then we are to baptize. Baptize does not save you. A lot of people grow up thinking, oh, I, I was dunked as a baby. I'm good to go. Or I was, I was sprinkled as a teenager. I'm okay. I can do whatever I want. In fact, when I was baptized, I had a friend of mine came up to me and said, well, you can do whatever you want now. You're good to go. Your ticket's been punched. Right. I was like, Jeb, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> um, my ticket was punched by Christ, and believing in that, I'm good to go. But the, the getting wet thing wasn't, wasn't what did it. It's, it is, though, an outward symbol, uh, an act of identification with Christ. It's a public testimony that I belong to Jesus Christ. Here at Freedom Church, we practice believer's baptism, so, so we believe you have to, to be old enough to understand that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that you can't save yourself, that Christ died for you. You have to be old enough to, to truly understand that. And it's different for every person, right? But if you've never been baptized, or if you were baptized as a baby, but, but want to be baptized as a believer, come talk to me. We love baptisms. I would love for a reason to go to Big R and buy a stock tank so I can baptize you or have you over to our house and use our bathtub, some, whatever, it doesn't matter. Right? Maybe we can get a barrel or something. Right? I'd love to baptize you guys. And then finally, we are to teach these new believers to follow Christ. Evangelism doesn't end with conversion. The disciples of Jesus were to be taught to obey Christ from their heart. Right? We can't claim Jesus as our Savior, refuse to obey Him as our Lord. Our, our hearts need to be transformed. And that's, what, that's what teaching is. That's why we as at Freedom Church, we, I like to call us an equipping church because we want to equip you to, to learn and, and study for yourself and then take what you're learning and, and share with people all of them. That's why on the notes that you have that you can take that and go teach other people. Right? I don't have a monopoly on the truth. I don't need to. Anyway, yeah, go teach. But what I love too is that, that this command to go make disciples, we're not left on our own. Because let's be honest, that's pretty scary, isn't it, to talk to others about Jesus? But what is Jesus saying? Be sure of this. I am with you always to the end of the age. There was a promise promise and to the end of the age have we reached the end of the age yet no so that promise that christ is going to be with us as we make disciples is still there for you and for me so the disciples and us we have nothing to fear for jesus who is the all-powerful savior would be with them he'd be with us he would strengthen them he would strengthen us to accomplish this command at christmas time what, what is one of the names that, that jesus was given emmanuel right we sing a lot of that songs. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. <clears throat> Jesus will be with us until he returns to judge the world and establish his earthly kingdom. And then the promise that he gives here for the believer is fulfilled through the Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 28, God 
vindicated his son. The resurrection of Jesus proves he's the king, that he's worthy of our worship. He defeated our sin at the cross. He defeated death at the resurrection. And when God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, it was in order that he would be worshipped. That he would be worshipped. Believers, we're called to offer our very lives as worship because of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. And one day, as we've talked about, everyone will confess that Jesus is king to the glory of God the Father. So now you have heard this truth concerning Jesus' resurrection. We must not, like the religious leaders, deny it. Because only belief in Jesus' resurrection can, can secure that victory over sin and death for us. So, what about you? Where are you at? What do your words and actions reveal about your response to the good news of Christ? About your response to his death and resurrection? Have you received that message? Have you believed that message with joy? Or are you like the religious leaders that have denied God? I think you know where I believe you should be. But I can't believe for you. This belief in the resurrection of Christ has to be on you. I wish I could believe for you. I wish I could. But I can't. I wish I could believe for Cora. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we get to gather with believers and worship you and praise you. Lord, that you've given us a command to go and make disciples, to take the, the truth of, of your word, the truth of this message to every people group. But that starts with our home. That starts with our own heart. That starts with our own family. So Lord, give us the courage to do what may be hard and difficult. It may run counter to the culture that we've created, the culture that we live in, the friends that we have. But we know that your word is true and we know that we must believe. I pray, Father, that the Spirit would equip us to also follow. Thank you for the empty cross. And thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the opportunity to believe.